Hello, my name is Alexandru and welcome to this talk. Together with Alex my colleague Alexandru here, uh, we've been contributing to TalkOS for the last year. And uh, in, throughout this talk, we will talk to you about uh, the latest project that we uh, have been working on, uh, about building a low latency secure embedded system using uh, eBPF. Uh, by the way, even though this is a rec pre-recorded uh, session, uh, it is recorded live. So if something goes wrong, it will go wrong. Uh, now I will ask Alex uh, to make an introduction about uh, how TalkOS works. Thank you, Alex. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm really excited here that we can talk about Talk, um, an operating system written in Rust. Uh, a few words about Talk. Um, it's a uh, modern operating system designed for microcontrollers, so um, drone controllers or industrial devices. Uh, that is basically the, basically modeled after a normal operating system like Linux. It runs several applications, has a separated kernel, so on and so forth. Um, Alex, if you can move the slide, please. Um, a few words about um, details about Talk. Uh, it's a preemptive operating system, meaning that it can stop applications and swap them on the CPU. Uh, it currently runs on Cortex M processors and RISC V processors. Um, an important feature of Talk is that it uses the memory protection unit or something similar in the RISC V processor, and every application runs is in its own memory sandbox. In other words, applications will fault, similar to a sec fault in Linux. An important feature of Talk, which makes it unique in the um, MCU operating system space is that it has a separated kernel. So it just it's just like Linux, which has the Linux kernel and on top of it applications, Talk has the Talk kernel. It is written fully in Rust. It is compiled separately and loaded separately on devices. On top of the kernel, we have the user space or the applications. Applications can be written in any language as long as it compiles for the platform and will be loaded separately to the board. Um, Alex, this is the general architecture of the TOC operating system. Uh, at the bottom, we have the hardware or the microcontroller. On top of the microcontroller or the board, we have the kernel, which is composed out of three parts. First, we have the low level drivers, which are represented in orange here. These are drivers that directly interact with the hardware. Uh, in our case, and this is really, really important, these drivers are considered to be trusted code. This means developers can use any means to write them, including unsafe code in Rust. Um, on top of the kernel, we have the capsules. Capsules are high upper level drivers um, that usually either export system calls interfaces to the applications, either export services to other capsules, uh, from the kernel point of view, these are untrusted, meaning they only contain safe Rust code. It means we cannot direct access memory. We have to obey all the rules of the Rust compiler. The glue code between these two levels is the actual kernel. The actual kernel, again, is a trusted piece of code, meaning it does make use of unsafe. It handles processes, the scheduler, and all the interfaces that the capsules use to communicate with each other. This kernel is a completely separate part and is uploaded as a firmware to devices. On top of the kernel, we have the processes. Processes, as I said before, can be written in any, app, any programming language as long as they compile. This is completely untrusted code and applications are sandboxed to their own memory space. And yes, um, this is a new feature that talk brings to the table, they fault. So what's the problem? Due to the design of talk, um, the operating system is not an actual real-time operating system in the sense that it doesn't have low latency. All the interrupt handlers in talk are bottom half handlers. This means that when an interrupt arrives, uh, certain peripherals needs Need, needs attention, it signals the, C, the MCU. The MCU signals the operating system, meaning TOC. TOC registers that it needs to process the interrupt, but then continues in the kernel and will process the interrupt a little bit later. 
This is due to the design of TOC. Another important aspect of TOC is that the kernel is not preemptive. So in TOC, we have only one single thread that runs the kernel, meaning that if a driver or an interrupt handler takes longer to execute, all the others will wait. It cannot be preempted. So everything happens in bottom half handlers. Um, on the other hand, TOC provides applications which are sandboxed. So whenever we usually want to add functionality to a system, we will update an application. Now, this design is not great if we have a um, low latency system, like a drone, which needs to, uh, which has a flight controller, or like a high speed industrial line, where the response needs to be really, really fast. So our main problem is, how can we run arbit arbitrary code really fast, but still obey um, Tox security sandbox? And I'll let Alex continue from here. Okay, so uh, what we want to achieve, as Alex said, uh, we want to run arbitrary code in the kernel. This uh, managed without actually recompiling the kernel. So this is where uh, the eBPF part comes into play. Uh, eBPF was created uh, with the main purpose of extending the kernel cap capability at runtime, uh, which means that we have a sandbox environment inside the kernel, which is used to uh, run eBPF code that is passed from the user space. This being done without, have, without having the need uh, to modify the kernel's, kernel source code, because this is happening at kernel runtime, operating system runtime, and also without the need to load additional kernel modules. Initially, the eBPF um, standard was created uh, in order to, to be used for networking purposes, such as uh, the name says, uh, extended Berkeley packet filter. Uh, as for use cases, uh, the main three that I will present here are the main uh, original uh, use cases. Well, the first one being uh, having uh, managing high performance networking so that um, at runtime in the kernel we can add additional protocol parsers or uh, maybe even forwarding logic when a packet uh, comes from the network. Uh, the second use case would be uh, having uh, security enforcement. So uh, the eBPF uh, framework coming as a system call filtering uh, framework. Um, which can also act for uh, process uh, context tracing. And also the last use case, which can be um, used for uh, enabling uh, eBPF programs that are run uh, as uh, breakpoints throughout the uh, process. Uh, the last use case that we come with for, uh, for our um, uh, framework is to uh, use eBPF programs in order to use to execute fast interrupt handlers in, uh, in TOC. Therefore, the new architecture that Alex presented earlier would look like this. Inside the capsules, we would have a new capsule uh, that is able to interpret uh, and create a VM a virtual machine uh, that runs eBPF code. And inside the application, uh, we can upload through to the capsule, we can send to the capsule uh, the eBPF code that should be run in, in case of an uh, interrupt. So it would look like this. We have an uh, external interrupt that comes on a pin, for example. We upload the eBPF code that needs to be run when that um, interrupt appears. The, capsules, the capsule has set the uh, the eBPF code, and when the interrupt uh, appears, uh, the VM is created and the eBPF code that we uh, uploaded earlier will run. Um, what we used in order to impl implement eBPF inside the cap capsule was uh, the RBPF module, uh, which is a user space virtual machine for Rust. Um, we, to which we had to do several modifications because uh, this is a user space uh, module. It has a lot of uh, standard library dependencies, which cannot appear inside um, inside um, operating system which has no uh, no such dependencies. So first we had to remove all uh, dependencies such as uh, usage of vec, which is the vector for uh, for Rust. 
uh, then we had to remove the unsafe code blocks because as Alex explained earlier, inside, inside prop capsules, we ca cannot have uh, unsafe code blocks. Then the last thing, uh, this module came with a lot of uh, just-in-time compiler implementations, which are not uh, a needed feature inside of talk. That would be all. Thank you. Um, as, if I may add another comment, Alex. Um, one um, thing that is usually important at eBPF is that it is guaranteed to finish. Um, so why did we choose eBPF to run this and not some other arbitrary binary code? First, eBPF can be compiled by LLVM. So whenever talk users build their applications, they can automatically build the eBPF part in their application. Secondly, uh, compilers like LLVM try to unwind the code and restrict the code from making infinite loops. And third, we use the virtual machine and not a JIT because that way we can count the number of cycles that that machine performs. And if it uh, surpasses a certain limit, we simply stop the machine, the eBPF machine. This will guarantee us that any capsule that runs eBPF code will actually finish in a certain amount of time. Um, this being said, thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. And uh, we kindly uh, encourage you to uh, take a look at our project on GitHub and we expect contributions. And if you have any questions.